Ladies and gentlemen, on your behalf, I want to pay a personal tribute to an icon of our society. In fact, he is sitting quietly amongst us tonight. Here he is, in all his glory at the age of one. Can you recognize him? The main clue to his identity is that crop of hair. This little fellow was born on June the 27th, 1913, in Lisbon, North Dakota. He is therefore about to reach his 90th birthday. And the executive thought we should help him celebrate this milestone tonight. Lee Wiltsey, please stand up again. Thank you. Lee, you will no doubt wonder how that photograph came into my possession. <laughs> Don't concern yourself. All will be revealed in good time. Lee, from delving into your past, I learned that you grew up in North Dakota on a small cattle ranch of a thousand head. At the virile age of 19, it was time to look further afield. You decided to not spend the rest of your days driving this tractor, occasionally doffing your hat as a full-breasted black female would saunter past on four legs. <laughs> In addition to being a ranch, your father was a skillful carpenter and an inventor with a number of patents to his name. It was the qualities of dexterity and curiosity you inherited from your father that influenced your decision to become an orthopedic surgeon with a keen interest in research. But what about the role of your mother? The most important figure in a man's life, according to Dr. Sigmund Freud, an authority on mental instability. <laughs> now, I know Americans are all into psychoanalysis, so allow us to consult with your alter ego. It usually is your mother, isn't it, that uh, makes you do these things? I don't know. Everybody's a little bit different. Who could that be you were talking to? Surely not Dr. Freud. No, it is none other than Dr. Farfan, also an expert on instability. <laughs> I wonder what Dr. Farfan thought were the important earlier influences on your life. Oh, so you got the curiosity from your dad and your will. And your mother, I suppose. Perfect, perfect combination. Well, yes. Wait now, we... Thank you, Harry. Lee, with the knowledge that both parents were responsible for your career path, allow me to remind you of the steps you took on this marvelous journey, led by curiosity and backed by will. You graduated from the Buttsville High School in 1930. Sixty years later, you returned to see what remained of this hamlet and found the place deserted with not a butt to be seen. <laughs> you went to Teachers College at Ellendale, North Dakota, and after one year obtained your teacher's certificate, which guaranteed you a position at the princely sum of $65 per month. In a small country town, you taught for two years at a boys' school. It consisted of a single room where you instructed all grades. Here you are shown with all your pupils. Was it this experience that paved your way for a lifetime of teaching residents and fellows? You went to the University of North Dakota, starting in the fall of 1933, receiving your BA in June 1936. History, which you studied then, has continued to be one of your lifetime passions. Lee, I do hope you're enjoying this history lesson. 
You entered medical school at the University of North Dakota. In the fall, in the fall of 1936, transferring to Northwestern Medical School in the fall of 1938. Lee, isn't it amazing the way everything important in North America seems to happen in the fall? A time of the year that people in other English-speaking regions refer to as autumn. In my part of the world, fall is more commonly used as part of an expression to explain how a lady became pregnant. She fell pregnant, suggested it just happened, it was not her fault, and it usually wasn't. <laughs> Lee, you received the Doctor of Medicine degree in 1940, and you began your internship at Charity Hospital in July of the same year. Up to this point in your life, the expression you presented to the camera whilst dashing was somewhat serious. It was as though someone had been putting the screws on you. I think we need to consult your alter ego on this matter. Those days, and you may not believe it now, but the, in those days the older orthopedic surgeons had, a, had more power over us, or I know them now, but then the, they do now. Now a young man can get by with a lot, but uh, they would just turn the screws on you and uh, you had to toe the line more, let's put it that, I guess. <laughs> During your residency in 1942, something happened that put a smile on your face, leading to the most important day in your life, once again, in the fall, <laughs> once again in the fall, on August the 16th, the day you and Dorothy were married. You entered the US Army at Walter Reed Medical Center, Washington, D.C., on January the 1st, 1944, where subsequently you became Chief of Orthopedics. As it happened, in the fall of 1945, Dorothy fell pregnant. And your, <laughs> and your daughter, Emily, was the result. It disproved that well-known proverb, pride comes before a fall. This was one of those happy occasions when pride came after a fall. After two years in Dallas, Texas, you moved to Long Beach, California, where you remained in practice for the better part of half a century. You became chief of the Department of Orthopaedic Surgery at the Memorial Medical Center of Long Beach and in 1965, clinical professor of orthopaedic surgery at the University of California, Irvine. It was in 1965 that Vert Mooney became the first of a long list of fellows to be taught by you over the next 32 years. Have you noticed how well dressed Vert is in this photo taken 20 years ago? <laughs> Vert, stand up. And look how well dressed he is tonight. As you don't seem, Lee, to understand the significance of this, we need to consult with your alter ego once more. Long after the bad old days of Haight Ashbury in San Francisco, and we'd have them in sandals and uh, slack, or I mean jeans and uh, shirt out of their trousers. They thought that's freedom, and I had to tell them, "No, you're a, you're a doctor." And you As might be expected, many of your fellows are here tonight, and I know for a fact that all of them are extremely grateful, not only for your tutelage, but also for your friendship, generous support and advice on appropriate dress code. The list of your lifetime achievements is far too long for me to cover in detail, but I do want to highlight some of them. Despite being in full-time medical practice, you found the time and the energy to be deeply involved in postgraduate teaching activities and in orthopedic research, resulting in countless presentations and publications. Let us recall some of the major contributions that resulted from ideas flowing from your brain. What is probably not known by many here tonight is that in 1950, you conducted the very first experimental work to test methyl methacrylate for its possible use in orthopedic surgery. Dorothy was indirectly responsible for this. Her brother, a dentist, on his return from the Second World War, told you about this new cementing substance. 
and you carried out this experimental work which was cited by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons as a major contributor to modern hip surgery and that was a large feather in your cap. Without any doubt, the works most associated with your name concern your numerous studies on spondylolisthesis and in particular the muscle splitting approach you developed for posterolateral fusion. Wiltsey is a household name in orthopedic surgery. The Wiltsey muscle splitting approach is a term known by orthopedic surgeons the world over, including those surgeons whose spinal experience is limited to their years of training. And that is certainly another feather in your cap. Your work on chemonucleosis and your development of a transpedicular screw fixation system are amongst your many other significant contributions. More feathers in your cap. Your paper with Larsen et al. on the far out syndrome alerted surgeons to look outside the square or to be more precise, outside the spinal canal. Poor old Larsen. His mind was never quite the same after this revelation. It sent him to the far side, necessitating a career change from orthopedic surgeon to orthopedic cartoonist. Lee, as I described yesterday, you were instrumental in bringing together the forces behind the formation of our society, serving initially as the interim president and then as the first president of Issels. The fact that you have always been a keen student of history may have had something to do with history repeating itself 11 years later. During the 1985 Issels meeting in Sydney, I noticed a flurry of political activity amongst the North Americans. There were many clandestine meetings in corridors between you, Dave Selby, Vert Mooney, Walt Simmons and Harry Farfan, with numerous phone calls to and from the US. I thought to myself, what on earth are the Americans getting up to this time? I discovered later that what you were doing was applying the skills you had learned 12 years earlier, this time helping to bring together two spinal organizations in North America to form NAS. In a repeat of your earlier role with Issels, you became the first president of NAS. Lee, you get two feathers in your cap for these achievements, but I'm afraid you lose one for allowing NAS, your adolescent child, to become so large and boisterous. With so many feathers in your cap, it was inevitable you would be gain the highest possible accolade of your alma mater. In the fall of 1986, the University of North Dakota recognized your exceptional lifetime achievements when it presented you with a Sioux Award. And here you are, pictured just after the presentation, in full headdress with your family, Lamont, Emily, Dorothy and Mary. Lee, in your earlier years, it would seem your exposure to the opposite sex was limited, being one of eight brothers and teaching in an all-boys school. The arrow points to this wonderful photo taken of your proud father with his eight sons. Another of your many lifetime achievements was to redress the male dominance of your earlier years, positioning yourself in female company whenever the opportunity arose. Lee, I said redress, not undress. <laughs> Out of consideration for Dorothy, I've had to censor the other images of your exploits. Lee, your orthopedic heroes include names such as Robert Jones, R.I. Harris, Bosworth, Aldridge, King and Philip Wilson Sr. In turn, Dave Selby, a past secretary of Issels, was a great fan of yours. A skillful sculptor, he captured this wonderful image of his hero. Another fan, Harry Crock, took this delightful portrait of you. It reveals your relaxed, thoughtful, composed and unhurried style. Not to be outdone, you took this portrait of Harry. <laughs> As they say, a picture says a thousand words. Buoyed with this success, Harry and you carried out a simultaneous combined pressing of the delayed timer on the camera, producing this simultaneous combined portrait. Walter Matto and Jack Lemon, who starred in Grumpy Old Men, could not have done better. Lee, you always take pride in keeping up with new technology, often getting ahead of the rest of us. An example of this is your taking of digital images, many years before digital cameras became generally available. Here are just a few examples of the numerous digital images you've taken over the years.
Perhaps you can explain to me why it was that you so often captured our founding chairman on the receiving end of the digit. Something that Harry did not seem to mind too much from his wife Arelli, but certainly he did not enjoy it from KW. Could it be that Kakodi Willis from Western Canada was telling Harry in no uncertain terms what would happen to him and the rest of French Canada if Quebec were to secede? And is there any truth at all in the rumour that a split second after you took this shot, KW almost lost the tip of his terminal phalanx? Lee, from the photos I obtained through my secret agent, it is hard to see much change in your appearance during the past 25 years other than an increase in colour in your cheeks. Harry Farfan obviously knew what he was talking about when he said to you many years ago, so you got your curiosity from your father and your will from your mother. Here is your mother at your stage of life on her 90th birthday. It is easy to see from whence you inherited the sparkle to complement longevity. Lee, without doubt, the most successful fusion you ever performed was the joining of your hand in marriage with Dorothy's. Although Harry Farfan gave special praise for Dorothy's role during the formation of Issels, describing her as the mother of our society, it was not until she sent me an enormous file on your lifetime achievements that I fully appreciated her true worth. And I'm not referring to Dorothy's skill at espionage or purloining. What her perceptive and detailed comments that accompanied this information revealed was that Dorothy has been very much involved in all your lifetime achievements. Furthermore, she is your greatest admirer. The Wiltsies have not wilted. Dorothy and you have been married for over 60 years, a truly remarkable achievement in this day and age. Lee, your indispensable role in helping to form missiles and your outstanding lifetime achievements would not have been possible without Dorothy's unwavering love and support. In recognition of the lifetime achievements of both you and Dorothy, the executive is pleased to announce that the name of the highest accolade given by the society has been changed. From now on, it will be known as the Wiltsey Lifetime Achievement Award, sponsored by Stryker. <clears throat> Lee and Dorothy, I would like you to both come up beside me and open an envelope containing the name of the recipient of the Wiltsey Lifetime Achievement Award for 2003, after which Mr Tracy Brown from Stryker will present the award. As they come up, ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding. I'd like everyone to join with me in singing Happy Birthday to Lee. Happy birthday to Lee, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Lee, happy birthday to you. Hip hip, hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Rob, this is just fantastic. I am so totally surprised. I, I just have no idea. And I've, I wonder where some of that information came from. And it may have from my wife, but she absolutely didn't tell me about it. <laughs> I'm wondering what she kept secret all these 30 years. <laughs> well, I'll never know, I guess. Uh, it, it, this has been, spine surgery has been a grand voyage for me. And um, this organization, ISLIS, and all of you have been a great part of it. All my life when I was able to think about it. I always wanted to uh, um, say that the uh, cup was half full, but tonight my cup runneth over. Uh. And uh, 
I want to uh, tell all of you and Rob that uh, I want to use some uh, some lines from the greatest of the English writers of all time. It's from uh, Twelfth Night. I can no other answer make but thanks and thanks and ever thanks. Will you leave, will you leave? Ladies and gentlemen, a toast to Lee and Dorothy. To Lee and Dorothy.